is able to process information in a non-deterministic way because there's infinite re, uh, there's infinite amounts of data coming at you through your sensors. Your sensor approximates it. I don't really mind which of these, but because my explanation of what why the brain isn't computable is actually quite mundane, but it's really interesting. Hey guys, if you haven't already subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. It's a huge, huge help. Thank you. So now, and it's locked with creativity. So the hint here is, isn't it interesting that human brains can come up with new things all the time that you can't write programs to do? We can't write programs that will come up with creativity. Now, I want to make my position clear. I'm not a dualist. I, a what? A dualist, where I think that there's a separation between mind and, mind and matter. Okay. Right? That there's some kind of spirit. I believe that, I believe, I think, I can prove, but I have to have some belief, right? I believe that I'm the, the, the material stuff is all we have, right? So in principle, it should be possible to make an artificial brain that has an artificial consciousness. Now, is the brain a computer is a really hard question because it goes back to everything in this conversation is about definitions, right? Yes. What is a computer? Now, a computer is a thing where I can put data in and I have a program and I get that data out and it's reliable, right? I get a mapping. I run an algorithm. And then the brain is running an algorithm. Then one goes, oh my God, you've just broken the church Turing thesis. And I'm like, no, the brain is not an algorithm. The brain is doing something. And this is where I disagree with a guy, a um, very nice philosopher, sadly died recently, a guy called Dan Dennett. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was on Brian Keating's show, I think. Yeah, yeah. Dan Dennett wrote a very nice book called yep. Darwin's Dangerous Idea. It's a fantastic book. It's one of his best books. I recommend everyone to read it. But there's one thing in the book he says that evolution is an algorithm. It's not. Evolution can be approximated using algorithms, but it's not. It's doing something else. So let right, me... Wait, wait, wait. E evolution can be approximated using algorithms? You can simulate, you can simulate a evolution in like. a computer. Okay, yes. Right. So what am I saying? So I'm saying the brain is not computable. Now, why is that? Now, uh, one super, one really important thing is about and and i think i'm going to put this as simply as i can um so what i what did i say i think the argument is like um the the brain is not in principle computable mm. now why is that well a computer has a memory it has a it has a program it has an architecture the problem with the human brain is the human brain um is creating new um, let's say the metadata constructs mm -hmm. in time and the basic the brain's capacity to work at the boundary between infinity and finiteness is what we find difficult to compute now what i mean by that capacity between infinity and finiteness yeah, basically human brains or brain, biological brains are able to mine creativity from the future and instantiate it in the present. Yes. Like, what the shit does that mean? Yes. All it means is there's more time in the future, which means you have a bigger state space, a bigger number, larger number of boxes for you to pull on, and you pull those into the present. Think about your imagination. What is an imagination, right? The imagination is for you to be able to take all the, all the experience that you've had in your life and re and using inputs you got from today yes. maybe you might get inspired you might have stubbed your toe like or something go ouch didn't like that and then oh i got this idea for this thing that came from this you mining the environment in the present yes so here's how it works that your brain is able to process information in a non-deterministic way because there's infinite re, uh, there's infinite amounts of data coming at you through your sensors your sensor approximates it and the and you have this ability to imagine, and I'm explaining it really poorly. But all I'm basically saying is, computers don't have enough memory, <laughs> and they don't have enough uh, potential to basically get all the data from the environment. And it's that data from the environment, and that huge memory is what makes it non-computable. And that's a very nice practical. No, point. that's interesting. That's, that's a, really interesting because, in principle, I cannot compute what a cell is going to do next. It does weird stuff. So 
and the thing is, we've become to totally, we're fantasizing about control with neural networks. If it's in distribution, we can predict it. If it's out of distribution, we can't. Yeah. I love to be out of distribution. That's what I do. I like to do weird shit on a day. I mean, not weird shit, but I, I don't judge. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, who, you know, who knew that, uh, uh, like, I don't know, 10 years ago, I would suddenly decide at some point I would just wear pink and have pink shoelaces. Yeah, the I don't shoelaces know. really threw me off. Uh, it's like, where does that come from? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You were at an investor's meeting before this? <laughs> yeah. Ballsy. I yeah. like that. I gotta have, I've got to have a uniform. <laughs> um, so I think the fact that, so the very mundane reason why biology is not computable is the number of states you're trying to get access to is just huge. And the and the information coming from the environment is not noise, and so and this is and I'm getting close to it. I can reveal I've revealed revealed part of it, but there's also things about the fact that um, people think that natural selection comes through random mutation and random processes, right? And there is some of that, but I'm be, I'm beginning to see evidence of contingency everywhere. My one contribution to reality is like, huh. The past counts. Like, if, like, you know, if you say to me, you know, what one thing would you like to tell people yeah. <laughs> that is the most important thing in science? It's that phrase, the past counts. Yeah. Can we can we go back on what you just said, though, yeah. about natural selection yeah. with random things happening? Yeah. I don't – are you saying, like, random things, the way they're defining it, or, you know, let me make one up right now. A bird at the Galapagos where Darwin was first, obviously, like – Coming up with this theory, he realized that the beak changed in size on the top over a 200-year period or something so they could catch this fish instead of that one. What about that is random, though? Because to me, that says the environment said there's this type of fish. That's the one they need to survive. So it's not random that well, then it corrected for that. No, no. The way that biology so it works, I mean, I go back and forth on this. Okay. And that the way what happens is, sure, that's not random. The, the environment says, hey, I'm here. Yeah. What happens the way the the way that natural selection did that is that mutations would generate generate a large number of birds with different beaks, mm -hmm. and you, through trial and error, um, that mutation which would randomly occur helped you. It would just the bio, the because then that random mutation caused the bird to then be able to get the fish, and it's a, it 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 was able to to procreate right more effectively because more energy yet that was selected for. And that actually is, I'm okay with that. I mean, I'm okay that that, that kind of process is random-ish, but there is contingency in the processes in the environment, right? And I, I don't know that um, what I'm saying is materially significant yet because there's a huge body of evolution that says, look, the neo-Darwinian thesis is like, look, it's all survival of the fittest by a natural selection Natural selection occurs by random mutation in the genome. The random mutation in the genome just lot, gives you a lot of trial and error, and the environment selects. So in mm. a way, from that point of view, that's how okay. it works, right? And that's yeah. fine. Yeah. But I'm saying in biology, it's not just random. There are other things in the environment that give you information that you can use. And so I think there's a little bit of refining there. For the most people, it doesn't make a difference. But for science, right? One of the reasons why people got really upset with the assembly theory paper is it basically said something really obvious that is probably correct, but they didn't like it because it it really didn't it, 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 it was just not it just cut across so many paradigms. Mm. We can come to that in a moment. So I I think that biological evolution is very good at creating novelty because novelty is what you need to survive. If you think about the music industry, like I mean I want to I. I used to compose electronic music when I had some time, but now I'm a You were an EDM guy? I, I did loads of, loads of crazy stuff. All right, we're going to play I, some I, afterwards. I, I, it was just like, I would love to do find the time to do it. But you think about it, in any competitive environment, you can do the boring thing where you can say, well, the, the culture likes this music. I can just facsimile that and just do a variation on the theme and I'll be quite good and I'll sell some stuff. But occasionally... How do you compete in the environment? We well, have to be, you have to be illogical. You have to do things that you think that people or that people will just know that and it won't work. And of course, what else can you do? If you've got a completely rational environment and everyone's deterministic and doing the same yes. thing, the only way you could actually compete with anyone else is actually be illogical. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so it's a bit like why maybe 
you know, why the current manifestation of the American experiment is really interesting because the politicians are like, well, yeah, we're kind of boring having this tit for tat with two parties, but let's have a crazy thing happen or a, a, <laughs> a non-deterministic thing happen. Yeah. And this is just evolution playing out the yeah. macro scale, but that's way above my pay grade. But I think there is, biology is capable creativity. That creativity does not seem to be computable. And again, people are faking it using LLMs and go, look at this, it's really creative. I'm like, sure, it's a good tool, but you selected it. You selected it. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you can't use LLMs to be creative, but you have to interact with them. And you're saying, therefore, because your point on imagination is based on our past and everything come together to that we know of to then form this new idea we get, I'm taking it to, to that next level. You believe ideas are a faction of the past. Yeah. That's why they come to us. I mean, so the really weird thing is the past, the future is not in principle predictable, right? Let me say that again. The future is not in principle, in principle. Predi in principle predictable, right? That's a very strong statement for me to make. Why is it not in principle predictable? Because the universe is expanding in time. And because you just don't have enough resource. And this is what the computationalists don't like. Right, the computation is like, no, no, no. I'm God. I'm going to learn it all. I'm. It's like, no, that, that you've got time. Time is. That doesn't mean you can't do useful things with computation. But to think that computation is the base of the universe is kind of without without any evidence. Thank you guys for checking out this clip. If you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe and hit the like button on this video. It is a huge, huge help. And if you'd like to check out this clip's full podcast episode, that link is in the description below or right here. And finally, you can follow me on Instagram and X by using the links in my description below.